I'd like to welcome you to Volume 1 of Pinchak Silat USA's Introduction to Pinchak Silat. Pinchak Silat is a martial art from Indonesia. The art I will be demonstrating here has had many different applications and additions to it through the what we call the Dutch Indonesian influence, which means that there has been a lot of European influence within the martial art itself. Pinchak Silat itself, what we're talking about right now. I have here uh, Mas Paquito, Mas Scott, and Mas Ben. Basically, Mas is, is an honorary title that signifies a certain ranking level within the Indonesian system, that of an instructor. The older instructors are usually uh, addressed as Pak, or if they're in the later years, usually as Bapak, meaning like a grandfather. What we have then basically in the Indonesian system is a series of movements and applications based on concepts rather than an application of only techniques. I'd like to give you a brief history of the Indonesian system, starting with its usage and its locations. Indonesia, the country of Indonesia, is actually composed of approximately 13,000 islands. The island chain stretches, if you were to look at an actual geographic distance, the equivalent of from California to, let's say, Maine in the United States. 13,000 islands also means that they have many different dialects, and also an inherent indigenous system of fighting, which has also been influenced by Chinese and or uh, Vietnamese movements, Chinese movements from the southern portion of China, and also from the northern portions of China. So the Indonesian art itself of Penchak Sila has been able to be tested, let's say, in the actual proving grounds of combat against other systems as well, and of course you learn from that experience. So the indigenous portion of the art is based on more of an animist kind of a system where different animals are, are viewed and you take the movements from the animals and you learn from those. Such as the tiger, the monkey, the crane, all of these different animals. The difference in the Pinchak Sila philosophy is that with an animal, the tiger always fights like a tiger, and mongoose always fights like a t mongoose, snake always fights like a snake. But we as human beings then are able to choose. We can choose to fight like one of the animal styles or forms, or we can choose not to and create something that's our own unique blend. And that's really the essence of the Indonesian system. So this unique blend then created a knowledge base based on angulation of attack and defense. The angulation of attack then became a system from which you could alter or deflect different incoming uh, strikes, kicks, etc. And it is the actual system of angulation and deflection that you're learning, not necessarily a specific technique. What I'd like to do here is uh, <clears throat> explain to you what the significance of the sarong is, or sarung as we say in Indonesia. It's basically uh, similar to um, a backpack, but the Indonesians have used this for many, many thousands of years. And what we actually have here is this portion here, the, the tie, lets people know that it's on my right side so that it uh, qualifies me as an instructor or someone of the instructor level. What the sarong is, or sarung, is actually a nice cloth that's used. Most of the time, it has been sewn so that it actually creates a tube. As you can see here, the tube is then oftentimes worn around the waist, as you saw me wearing before, and can also be worn around the shoulders, this way. The colors that you see are from the different areas or regions. So it's like a flag, you're walking around with a flag that um, identifies you from a specific area or region, also tends to identify your specific fighting style. What you see here then is of course I can carry items in my sarung. I can carry it behind the back, I can carry it in front as well depending on where I'm traveling. Sarung itself then can also be tied around the waist as you saw or if need be, can be quickly extracted from here. And since the Silat system is a bladed system, I now have something here <clears throat> as an empty hand practitioner to also capture and work with different blades. So that's really a utilitarian kind of an explanation for the use of the Salon or Salon. And what we have today is primarily for ornament. So I'd like to welcome you to the <clears throat> system of Pinchak Silat. Uh, the one we are describing here is through Dojo TV. It is the Pinchak Silat USA uh, group and we have taken many many different styles, 
teachers and brought them into a composite where the system of C-Lab can be preserved and we can archive everything for you. So welcome. Pinchuck Seal is primarily a bladed art. Most of the maneuvers that we have, training techniques, etc., are based on and the premise of the use of a blade. We utilize a rattan stick, a little different than bamboo. Bamboo is hollow on the inside, rattan is, has a solid core, and we use that for our training aids. It can also be used as a weapon. It tends to crush bone rather than cut, so it's equally effective in the right hands. What we're looking at primarily here is the use or length of the blades or the rattan stick is based on the person's anatomy. Most of the time as you're moving the weapon back and forth you want it to just barely skim the surface of the ground or if you're using the weapon in terms of from a hidden point of view you want it to be able to tuck it in. You'd like to have a little bit of exposure along the elbow so that you can also strike with it. What we're looking at primarily here is then of course the rattan stick which in Indonesia is called a tongkat. The tongkat just refers to the word stick, it's a translation of it, and any weapon or stick, let's say staff, that comes up past approximately the navel is then called a toya, which then gets into your longer staff work or spear. Primary method of holding the weapon here in the Indonesian system is pretty much in a neutral position, whether it be blade or the stick itself, the tongkat. It's in a neutral position, usually if it's a handedness, right-handed with the tip right here on the left hand. So what we're doing here now is I'm going to just show you some basic maneuvers with this to give you some finesse. I will be shifting the weapon so that I'm using both left and right hands, but I'm just going to show some of the basic maneuvers. Now, the grip on your tongkat is primarily used at the very end of it, this way here, so that it makes it more difficult for someone to disarm it. Some prefer to actually have a little bit exposed and will maneuver to minimize any kind of disarm. So the choice becomes pretty much that of the practitioner. Also what we're looking at here then is the initial uh, high speed movement of the stick is done with just the thumb and forefinger and then when you make contact you're shifting to the last fingers of the hand thusly. So when you learn to maneuver the weapon, the first move is to just use a simple twirling motion. So the forward twirl is simply to move the weapon in front of you and you try to minimize this kind of a cone. So what you'd like to do is you'd like to create like a shield that hugs your body and comes back around. To again, protect the lateral side of your body and your head. So as you can see, I'm twirling pretty much with just a thumb and forefinger, mostly for maneuvers, and then I'm stopping it and holding the weapon steady in the hand when I'm ready to make contact. We use a secondary hand for backup. We also then use this as a tool to get our twirling actions in and I will show you basically what all these movements are for later on. So we have an initial forward twirl and you'll want to go ahead and use an exchange. When you do an exchange on the twirl, it's rather simple. You simply place it into the other hand. As the twirl comes back up, you simply place it to the other hand shift it to the side and create your movement. Again, try not to get too much of a cone shape out here, but try to let the weapon hang a little bit closer to the body. Sometimes you'll tag your arm or elbow, that's okay, it's just a learning experience. Be glad it's not a blade. So what we have then is a simple forward twirl. Okay. What we have here then of course is after the initial forward twirl movement, you have the exchange. And then from here, we want to get into a downward figure eight. Now, the figure eight position is going to be with the reference point of your nose. So what you're actually doing is just cutting in front of the nose this way here, like this. Downward, bringing it back up and around, and down. Initially, you can just use the entire shoulder, as you can see here. And or you can also then graduate to a little tighter movement based on upper arm. And also then it can go right into just at the wrist. So again, your exchange here is simple, just place it into the other hand and allow for this exchange to take place. So you're, what you're looking to do is just create a cutting motion in front of you here. Now what will happen in terms of detail work is that you're going to create a backup with your other hand. 
so that when I'm moving, as my hand comes down, I'm covering high. As this comes up, I'm covering low. So you start to see a kind of a synchronous motion here where I'm starting to cover and cover different areas of my body where the stick is not. And that's something that you develop based on your practice skills. So again, the downward figure eight off of the forward twirl, simply come down, just like you see it here, just like that. Initially start with the shoulder, make them nice and big, easy to move. And then you can work on the wrist angle later, okay? From your figure eight movement, again using the nose as your reference point to strike down, what we'll do from here is we're going to create a fanning. In Indonesia it's called kipas, a fan, uh, just like a fanning movement. So what happens from here then is in your figure eight movement, you're also able to then move into a fanning position just like this. So what you're doing here is you're actually taking the weapon and creating a shield effect in front of you. You're using the elbow, to move in and out, inside line, outside line, and you're using your shoulder as well. When you start using your wrist, you'll feel it in the momentum of the weapon and you'll start to see a full circle develop, just like that. So I'm trying to create a shielding effect for myself there. So what we have then again as an exchange, you simply lay the weapon into the opposite hand and continue with the same movement. And again, it's the momentum of the weapon that creates the full 360 degree arc that you see here, which is very valuable to you, enabling you to offset and deflect different attacks. What we have next in our twirling sequence is to utilize the same fanning movement. So your fanning movement here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take and control the weapon so that now strikes from overhead. It's the same kind of motion, but we want to have the fanning movement now overhead. Try not to dip the weapon low as you come back, because obviously you may hit yourself. So make sure that you have a slight angle to the weapon as you're striking downward. So from the side view, you can see that I'm creating a slight downward angle of the weapon in front here, rather than just kind of coming across straight, which sort of risks my head. So you angle it down just like that and as you see a little more uh, advanced work you start using more upper body as well. What we have after the upward kipas here in terms of covering the high line, the upper one, the fanning movement here, is you're going to create an upward figure eight. So from your striking position here you're going to bring the weapon up from the side, again the reference point is your nose, to simply bring the weapon up in front of you and then come up again in front of you. I'm um, using a lot of shoulder movement here, so for your first basic movement, it's very easy. You can also add a lot more power with a strike from the shoulder. Then you can have a little more arm movement here and then of course basically just from the wrist itself. So again we're using an upward figure eight. So the transition from your upward or upper kipas fan here after you can do your exchanges again here and just working it from here you can have your exchanges again from these positions here and you're just laying the weapon into your hand creating finesse you're going to move from here then into your upward figure eight just like that same kind of program we come from this position here and you just lay it into your hand so you get good solid movement good solid movement in both hands, just like that. Again, I'm using my shoulder a little bit more right now to develop a little more power behind the strikes. So from these exchanges here, you now come through here to a nice easy flow into an elbow movement. And again, like I said, just a nice wrist movement right in front of you. Okay. What we have then from this position is we can also go from the figure eight position here, the upward figure eight, and then we're bringing it into a reverse twirl. Again, you're trying to minimize this cone-like shape here, this cone-like shape right here. You want to get a little bit larger circle so that it protects your body a little tighter. So now we're going into a reverse twirl, and again, when you went to your transition, simply bring it up, 
place it in the hand and allow the weapon to simply just fall through the arc, just like that. Uh, sometimes you want to use a very heavy weapon, heavy stick that can kind of pull along. The lighter weapons are harder to twirl because they don't have as much weight and therefore a little less inertia. So you're using a reverse twirl here, just like that, and you just do the replacement here like this, coming from your figure eight into your reverse twirl again, and back again, just like that. So I'm just keeping it nice and easy, and, and see I'm not worried about having a death grip on the weapon, you just let it kind of flow out, play with it a little bit, get the feel. We're trying to work the wrist angles, trying to work your upper body and arm, and your shoulder so that you're in a coordinated movement when you make your strike. This is Maas Scott Sobel. He's going to be demonstrating some of the stick twirls you just saw. And he's going to be able to just do some variety of variations on the theme. So again, it's just an exercise. There are just basic patterns there that you're using to strengthen the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder, and create some finesse and familiarity with the weapon. To complement your twirls, you will need to do other exchanges also for basic self-defense movements and or to cover angles that we consider blind. So one of the exchanges we're using here is initially just from your movement of the stick, nice and easy, you can create a stop and then a reverse, this kind of thing here. So what I'm doing here is I'm just bringing the weapon back and bringing it right over the top of my muscle here on the deltoid area and just creating a stop. So I have just this kind of an exercise here. So I'm just bringing the weapon to a stop movement here and a stop movement here. Bringing the weapon, stop movement here, stop movement here, just like that. Then you're creating a shielding action again here. From this position here, you can create your first exchange, just like that. So you're able to then cause a redirection here and off to the opposite side. This itself is coverage as well. So you're covering your line, and again for your exercise, you simply twirl and stop and create your exchange. From here, you can just move straight into the movement from here. And this is also a strike, striking to the knee or to deflect your opponent's strike. And you're bringing it up. Notice how when I bring it up, I'm also covering my face again here. I come up, I'm covering, I'm covering. So but the body language here starts to develop based on your experience as to what can be thrown at you. So again, from a just standard position or a stationary position, you just have your stops and your exchanges like this. Again, if you look at this angle here, it's a nice striking angle to the knee or to deflect your opponent's strike. Another exchange we'd like to use then is a capture, arm capture. So with the weapon traveling, moving, we're going to take the weapon and actually present like a stabbing motion towards yourself. From this angle it just looks like this, like I'm getting ready to stab myself. Okay, side view, looks like I'm getting ready to stab myself. What you're going to do is you're going to simply place and create a capture. So your movement looks just a little bit like this here, again very stationary. Make sure you make a nice exchange right here to cover and protect. Again, you want to have the weapon protecting your arm rather than your arm protecting your weapon. Simple safety feature there. So what we have here in our exchange again is, is I'm pulling the weapon in towards me and driving it through and I'm making my exchange just like that. I'm just taking over. Again, the weapon protects my arm for side attacks here and attacks 
to my head and upper body area. So that's what we want to do with this exchange. Very simple. Moving it, making your exchange, coming through, moving it, making your exchange. And yes, it is done with blades as well because you have a finesse and you understand the position of the handle so you can flatten the blade out and allow the blade to rest in this area here too. So it is done also with the blade. Another exchange that you can use is from the arm capture here. You can make your, again, coverage around the face. Arm capture here with coverage again past the face. And then also using a rear guard position, which is where the weapon comes up behind you here to protect against an attack, a blindsided attack. What you want to do is you want to make sure that the weapon doesn't drift this way here because if it is hit, it will also cause damage. You need to let, let the weapon rest against your body and most of the time what we do is we just put our fist right there against the spine. So the maneuver is such that I'm going to be again creating a stabbing movement towards myself here and creating a blocking angle here on my weak side. This also allows me then to do my exchange from this position here. It allows me to do my exchange and again always covering the face and the area around the neck, just like that. So if I move from here, opposite line, again I'm just shifting, allowing my fist to rest in the back of my, uh, small of my back I should say here, and then just reach up from here and pull the weapon back, trying to cover this area and shield the area of your face as well. Remember you're dealing with multiple attackers, so you have blind sides, and this is why we use this technique. One last exchange I'll share with you is basically protecting the legs so that we have a movement where from your twirls you simply swing the weapon back. It seems very elementary, but it's effective in again covering the leg area, swinging the weapon back, and simply creating an exchange from here. Notice that you cup and bring it up, back again from here. So you're cutting this area back here, cutting behind you. So attacks to the ankle, the knee, from behind here, I can cut the line real quickly, rapidly, and create a directional movement, again, covering high line from another attack coming through. several angles that the weapon can be delivered from. In the Indonesian system, in Penchak Sila, we have 16 angles. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate for you the different angles themselves and their initial setup. We are simply looking at a form that enables you to understand the direction and the basic angle from which you can be hit. So we're looking at initial movement here for you as a practitioner you need to learn how to hit in order to be able to understand fully what it is like to be hit. And without having to make contact, we're able to see the angles then approaching because of our ability to train diligently with a safety weapon like this or actual blades when you have regained the skills for that. So what we're looking at here then is initial position is just from your neutral position here you swing down, make a strike, again protect the face and place the weapon into the chest, just like that. Now you're looking at the weapon straight on here, it's coming up at a 45 degree angle and angling off at a 45 degree angle. Angles are extremely important. They give you structure and they give you stability. The other hand simply comes up and supports the line. That is the number one position. The 
second position or form we'll be using, number two, is to bring the weapon up in front of you like this so you can observe and look just over the top and the secondary is your arm coming up alongside of it so it's protected by the weapon itself. So your side view here is just like this. Here and here. Again, these are just stationary positions. Next we have position number three off the Tonkat series. You're going to take the blade or stick and place it onto the hip, just like this here. Just along the waistline, just slightly below the waistline actually. Just place it onto the hip. Notice it is not directly in front, it's angled off just slightly. And again, a coverage hand right here. The next position we have or form is the number four position. The weapon's coming out in front of you this way, and your arm is out straight in front of you. The weapon's at a 45 degree back, and the other arm supports that position. The side looks like this. The opposite side looks like this. And again, I'm creating like a mountain or triangle position with my arm right in front of me here, and I'm creating support just like that. That's number four position. The number five form position is right here at the side. Secondary hand is just covering this entire area here. Notice how the palm is in an upward position, ready to swing the weapon forward. The number six position or form is basically coming down protecting the knee. Just bring the weapon tip right down to the knee area here and again you have a secondary protecting from here. So you want to have the hands in proximity. The number seven position or form is low to the ground. Again we're going to be lowering our whole body line down. We're going to hold the weapon to our side right here. It's going to be swinging later just flush and even with the floor. The number eight position or form is again low to the ground. Just drop down and have the weapon at your side here. Again, you're going to be skimming the floor in this position here. The other hand is up in a ready position. The next position is the number nine position, which comes up protects the forward position for you and you just cover with the opposite hand. So again it's in this position here, protecting from this angle, off on this side here, you're protecting the front line and with the thrusting kind of motion. Here. The number 10 position or form is simply to bring the weapon in front of you like this and then hold it for a forward thrust position just like that. With the number 11 strike, you're going to learn to palm the weapon, basically, that's what it's called in Western terminology. In this case, you're also going to place it up behind the leg, like this, so that it basically becomes invisible to your opponent. So the grip position for the number 11 move is to bring the palm facing out and forward, but you've got the weapon palmed back behind the leg, again, so it's not readily visible. If you're taking a stance, again, you're maintaining the hidden posture of your weapon. With the number 12 position or form, we're bringing the weapon straight up and we're going to be looking underneath. A little bit different than the number 2 line which was low. This is the number 12 line which is higher up. Again, we're going to be supporting this particular position of the triangle here with the opposite hand. Side view right here. I'm looking underneath my fist. Again, opposite side here. I'm protecting, I'm looking underneath my fist. Notice that my hand again is being protected by the weapon. The 13 position or form is based on a thrusting movement. Again, you're going to punch outward into a 13 position. The weapon is pointing directly in front of you. The supporting hand comes up and again creates a shielding action towards the face. 
So on the side view, you're looking at a downward thrusting position, 45 degrees down, supported by the inactive hand. Opposite side, again, you've got a downward thrusting position, and you're supporting it from the opposite side here with the inactive hand. The number 14 position comes from the opposite side. So we have this movement here. It's a scooping kind of motion right here. Bringing the weapon up, again, dropping it at a 45 degree angle, and you're bringing a supporting hand in behind it. It may appear awkward at first, but you need to pra practice this because it's one of your more esoteric lines. From the side view, you can see that I brought the weapon up and into position, and I'm supporting it, supporting it with the opposite hand. Opposite side, I'm bringing the weapon up, and I'm supporting it with the opposite hand. The number 15 position is a stationary position based on the initial exercise you learned earlier. Here we have the weapon coming up over our head and sliding around in the fanning movement, just like this, into position with the other hand supporting it. Now you're coming across, it's not like the 13 line thrusting, but you're coming across here to fan across and strike. So again, from this position here, comes up strikes and is supported. Opposite side comes up, strikes and is supported. The 16 line comes up similar to the 14 line. Comes up over the head and again you're using a fanning type of motion just like this to strike. It is not down as in 14, it is up and straight across, just like that. It's a little bit of a specialty line. Again, from this view, 16 line comes up, fans, and you're supporting with the opposite hand. Another view here, 16 line comes up, strikes, and you're supporting it with the inactive hand. This is my assistant, Mas Paquito. What I'm going to be doing here is demonstrating the actual quadrants in which you're learning to strike. So all the movements that you have been practicing from 1 through 16, including the twirls, can now be applied. What you're looking at here is a coordinate system based on a cross position. That's basically in a plus sign. You have a cross position in a multiplication sign, X. And these positions are held at the throat level and then again at around the level of the navel. So these are the areas and quadrants that you're going to be targeting. So what we have initially then is, if you just hold the weapon here for me please. Okay. My initial strike off of the number one line is going to be right here into this quadrant. So what we're looking at here is we're taking this area taking this area right here and creating it into a quadrant system. So we have a number one strike, or two strike. So I'm just going to be following that as my road map. So there's no need to learn extensive techniques. You can simply allow yourself to express the movements very quickly. Again, I'm working in the upper quadrant here for the number one strike. Anywhere in this quadrant, right, and through here. The number two strike, Again, anywhere in this quadrant and through here. The number three strike coming off the side of the body right here on the side. That's why you were loading it and chambering it before. The number four strike, as you recall, goes right here, coming in and striking. The number five strike comes in from the lower level and strikes to the knee. The number six strike. Again, you're defending, protecting your own knee, and then striking towards his knee, just like that. Number seven strike, you're going down to the ankle. The number eight strike, opposite side to the ankle. 
The number nine strike is going straight into the throat, which you can see right here. That's your targeting. Ten, going right into the abdomen. You use a secondary hand at supporting thrust. That's why you're learning to use these as part of your initial form. The eleventh strike, as you recall, was palm. Can you stand over there, please? We have the palm to the side here. Comes straight up, much like an uppercut. It's aiming for the groin area and anything else along the center line. The number 12 strike, as you recall, was loaded from here. I'm going to turn the weapon and come straight down with it. So I'm going to have Fakita to stand sort of with his back to the camera, just like this. And you'll see that the weapon is now coming straight down on him like this. Straight down along that line. Again, from this angle here. It's held high, high line, and it's cutting straight down. It can become a two-handed position right away. It can become a supported position right away. That's why the other hand is not drifting back in through here, but creating protection. In all the movements that you saw, there's always a protective hand bracing and keeping this other hand as backup. The 13 line, if you can move this way just a bit. The 13 line comes from a punching movement out this way, as I showed you earlier, and thrusts into the top of the lung. This area through here, if it were a blade, would puncture the lung, collapse the lung, it'd be a medical emergency. With the tip of a stick, what you're doing is you're actually hitting all the nerves that are coming out of his neck into his arm. 14 line is the opposite side. So I'm coming in from the opposite side, I'm targeting, I've got my angle on him, and I have a supported movement that thrusts through. 15 line, so I'm going to be striking across the top surface of my pattern. So I have a 15 line here, I'm striking and fanning the side of his head through the top of the line here, just like that. And the 16 line is the opposite side. I'm coming up, scooping, and fanning, and hitting the opposite side, top of his head. Again, you've got a supportive hand right here. So in your training, what you're trying to do is you're trying to learn how to take your position here, and you learn to feed the strike. Now it's very easy to feed the strike. All of the odd numbered strikes, just step forward with your right leg. All of the even number strikes, simply step forward with the left leg. Don't need to get fancy at this point, just become effective in coordinating your step. So I'm striking, I'm retreating, going into my position. Notice I'm just going from one side of the body to the other. This is what we're trying to accomplish here. So as I move, I seem to begin to strike, <clears throat> and I become very proficient at feeling the movement and creating a body, entire body, arm, leg coordination. Again, striking the knee, moving down. Notice when I come up, I'm going to, again, cover my head and face so I'm not exposed. Here again, coming down. I'm scooping this way here to cover my head and face, which actually leads me right into that number nine strike, into the throat. I'll cut down here, change my position to add momentum, strength, 10 line, cutting up, anywhere along the midline, supporting it with the number 11 strike right here. Notice again, footwork becoming very simple for you. This needs to be practiced. Dropping down along that 12 line. You had loaded in 12 here, now you can just come right straight down the 12 line, just like that. Punch out for the 13. Again, just changing your foot position. Here what you do for the actual application, if this were a blade, I would just simply slash across from here and then reintroduce the weapon here. I can thrust from here, augment from here. 15 line, I change my foot position again. Nice strike, across the top. And finally, 16. I change my foot position and I strike. This way there's a coordination of hand, body, and legs. What we'd like to do is just show a little more of a flow in terms of the striking patterns. So you go from 1 all the way through 16 
in succession. Now normally we can go from 1 all the way through 16 and then later as you advance they come in in a random order. You learn to throw them in a random order, you also learn to defend against them in a random order. So I'd like to go ahead and have uh, Moss Ben and Moss Scott just demonstrate the movement. Basically Moss Scott would simply go through the motions and Moss Ben will be the target. At this time we'll demonstrate the use of a safety stick. This is basically a, a weapon that's been covered with a, a hard foam so that we can work with a little more reality and contact so that we stay true to our targeting. Um, Moss Ben will go ahead and feed the lines so again you can see the strikes and he'll make some contact against Moss Scott. What we'll do right now is uh, present some applications uh, from a defensive point of view so that we have applications off of a, a different strikes with a defense. So one of the defenses you can use against from the neutral position is he's firing that number one line, the one line over here, right into the area, it's quadrant of my head, face, etc. I need to be able to become very cognizant of that, I need to be able to see it. So what I can do from here is I can move off the line. One of the easiest lines I can use is you just come in and punch him. Right there, just like that. So I'm punching him with my own weapon to stop his forward movement, and then I'm going to strip, not my clothes, but I'm going to strip the weapon across my weapon here. If I had a blade here, I'd be cutting him, otherwise I'm simply going to redirect his line. Okay, so what will happen here is I come through, again I'm punching from here. So I'm going to strip this line just like this, do not pull the weapon away, that leaves you wide open for his other shot right here. So make sure that you leave your hand where it is, coming up from here, and just simply knocking him off balance from here and stripping the weapon down. And then from here I can go ahead and apply application immediately into his face. He may or may not punch from over here. Again, you simply have another rotation from here and another rotation from here. So you're using your 11 strike now, and you're using like a 12 strike or a number 1 strike to create some discomfort, pain, or maiming, or cut if this is a blade. So again, very simple application here. I'm coming up with the shot, I'm pulling the weapon away here and leaving my weapon right in his face. I can tag from right here. I'm expecting this one to come through, cut right down to it, come back up, come back down, take out the next line. For a kill shot, that would be here. We try to show mercy, so maybe I'll take him on the shoulder instead. With the use of sticks and any kind of weaponry, I highly suggest the use of safety eyeglasses. Within the confines of any school or within the confines of any home or any practice session that you may have or giving demonstration, it's highly recommended. When applying the CELOC techniques, remember that practice makes habits. Be diligent in your practice. It's a lifetime study. It's not something you're going to pick up every day or in one day or in two days. It requires a lot of training, so stay focused on the techniques, review the tapes often, and you'll get there.